Welcome to this month's STEMS webinar. Um, today our speaker is uh, Nick Wardle for, from uh, Imperial College London. So uh, Nick is an uh, experimental particle physicist. Um, he's currently a lecturer uh, at, at Imperial. Um, his work mostly focuses on uh, uh, physics for the Higgs boson. So he's been involved in combinations of various channels of Higgs decays and uh, in precision measurements uh, of, of, of the Higgs boson. Um, he obtained his PhD uh, from Imperial as well on uh, the W and Z bosons uh, uh, at the CMS experiment at CERN. And then he moved on to working on uh, diphoton decays of the Higgs boson, which is one of the main channels for the discovery of the Higgs boson back in 2012. And in fact, he did his PhD thesis exactly on the discovery of the Higgs, Higgs boson. Uh, then he moved on to CERN as a CERN fellow. And then uh, after that, he came back to Imperial as an STFC fellow. And now he's a uh, lecturer uh, at Imperial. Um, in addition to Higgs physics, he has a long time interest uh, in statistics for high energy physics. Um, and uh, he's, uh, for example, a long time member of the statistics committee at the CMS experiment. And a uh, few years uh, ago, he was actually chairing the committee as well. Um, so, uh, so in addition to doing physics analysis, he has actually also introduced new methods and software for statistical analysis in, in high energy physics. Uh, including, for example, he has contributed to what is called the combination tool, which is one of the main uh, data analysis tools, uh, at least at the CMS experiment at CERN. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and today he's actually going to talk to us about one of the methodological innovations he has contributed. Um, so this is something called the discrete profiling method. Uh, so that will be the topic of Nick's talk today. So Nick, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Mikael, for that nice introduction. I'll, I'll share my slides. Okay, so hopefully you can see those. Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. So yeah, thanks very much uh, for the invitation uh, to, to to speak to you today at this at this seminar. Um, I think I uh, I should I should start by saying, as, as Mikhail says, I'm I'm mostly a particle physicist. So so I already immediately want to apologize to any statisticians if I if I say something which sounds wrong or is not quite the right language that you guys are using. Um, but nevertheless, I, I wanted to uh, to talk about this this method, which, as Mikhail said, is something we introduced in CMS a while back uh, to deal with a very particular problem that um, that is quite common in in, in high energy physics uh, searches and, and measurements. So the, the the method is this is this um, method that we call the the discrete profiling method, which hopefully will become clear why we call it that. Uh, and uh, in particular, we use it for for dealing with uh, uncertainties in 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 the uh, uh, background. Uh, distributions. Okay, so just to, to lay out exactly the sort of problem that um, uh, this method is, is, is trying to solve. So often, um, when uh, we have some 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 data set like a high energy physics data set, and we're trying to extract some physical parameter um, from uh, from that data set. So so here I'm always going to refer to these as, as, as uh, parameters of interest, but we can think of them just as the physical parameters that we, that we want to measure. And these are typically things in, in particle physics, like the, the, some signal yield of a process, maybe a, a branching fraction. Uh, it could be the decay time of some, uh, some long lived particle, or it could be the, the mass and width of, of some new resonance. Uh, but it could be any number of things. <clears throat> and usually we have uh, other parameters which we, uh, we don't know exactly what they are, but we also don't care about. So uh, in, in, in the statistics language, this is, uh, is what we call nuisance parameters. And, and for us, these are typically things like uh, the size uh, and the shapes of a particular background contributions. Maybe it's also the composition of, of, of the signal and things like that. So we don't really care what those parameters are, but nevertheless, we have to specify them somehow in our model. And then, and then there comes the issue that often we don't actually know what the true distribution, the true underlying distribution of some components, one or more components is. And this is typically the case where we have uh, some background um, process in our, uh, in our data, which is, uh, Maybe maybe very hard to simulate. So it could be, for example, from from um, QCD processes, which are, which are notoriously difficult to simulate, or there could be some effects in the in the data, um, like due to uh, acceptance effects from our cuts, or maybe uh, kinematic turn-ons from uh, trigger efficiency, which which makes the data hard to model. Um, so it's so it's quite often that we don't actually know what the true distribution of uh, of one or more of these components are. And we're left to try and figure that out from the data. So, of course, a common strategy I think everyone will know is just to fit some functional form to the data um, so that we don't have to rely on, on, on simulation. I say that there are other strategies that you can, you can follow, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, I'm really focusing on this idea that you, you want to fit some functional form to the data 
um, uh, and remove the, 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 the component that you're, you're really not interested in. Okay, so the example uh, I'm going to go through here is, is very much related to, to Higgs physics. So uh, that's where the original uh, idea came from. Uh, and so if, if I, uh, the plot here I'm showing you is, is, is one of the latest um, plots that we have actually at CMS um, using, using the very latest data. And, and this is just really showing you for summing, summing together all the different types of categories that we have, um, the distribution of the diphoton invariant mass. So this we can measure very well in our detector. Uh, from the energies of the photons, we can we can uh, calculate the diphoton mass, and uh, the, the the shape of the data you can see is this sort of smoothly falling background, and this is mostly coming from this kind of process, uh, which is basically uh, um, oh sorry, power on. Okay. Sorry, can you can, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, there was some okay. audio issue. Uh, now we hear you okay. Yeah. I just had a weird uh, warning that my speaker had changed, so I, I, I just turned that off. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, yeah, so so it's these kind of processes here where you have um, a production of two photons, but it's not not involving a Higgs. So these are the kind of processes that we don't care about, and that's actually mostly what you see here. And then this tiny little bump here in the middle. Um, is coming from uh, the thing that we care about, which is where you produce these diphotons via a Higgs. Uh, and that's really what we want to extract from, from that data. So we want to um, get the properties of this thing, not, not really all the rest of the background. So, so um, that's, that's kind of where we, where we are now, but certainly back in the, in the early days of, of the Higgs discovery and, and when we started um, uh, developing this method, the, the data really didn't look that, um, that, that obvious. And this is, this is more like the distribution that we have. So I'm going to use this um, distribution, which is um, uh, which is uh, some sort of simulated data, but it's it's very much um, inspired by the, the the type of analysis that we had um, around the time of the discovery. Just as a, as a toy example to, to to help us walk through the model. So the idea is we want to fit uh, some distribution or, uh, to this uh, to this data. We know it's maybe a, a smooth background, and we're looking for a bump somewhere in in the spectrum. And this is sort of applicable in the diphoton analysis that I, I just pointed you to. Um, but also uh, um, the case of the Higgs, the two muons, and then there's actually many other uh, types of analyses where this applies as well. Uh, and maybe um, we don't know what the shape should be. So as I said, maybe we don't have the right Monte Carlo, or we don't know what the effects of trigger turn on, selection bias, etc. So maybe we just guess a function, right? So, so you might say, okay, this looks like an exponential. Uh, that's a nice falling, falling um, uh, function, and I can fit a, a signal bump in the middle and see if I and extract the signal, and the, the fit looks quite good, right? By eye, that, you would say that that's a reasonable fit to the data. So the problem comes from, from, from this, where you notice uh, maybe one of your colleagues or, or, or one of your students comes along and, and with the same data, tries a different function, uh, and they have this red line instead. And, and equally, this red line looks like a good, good fit to the, to the data. So you say, okay, all's well. Uh, uh, either of these models is, is a good, uh, good choice. And then I don't know, a third colleague comes along or, or, an, or a different student comes along and tries this different function. Again, now you have the blue line. Again, a very nice looking fit to the data. Uh, you know, e equally valid if, if you could just judge by, by what, these, uh, what these functions were. So the big problem is that actually when you want to come and extract some, some information about the signal, so say you wanted to measure the amount of signal, the signal rate uh, in this bump, the different functions, although they, they all give a nice fit, will ultimately give you a different answer for, for, for what your signal um, strength is. So they'll give you a different central value for the um, signal strength, but they'll also give you a different uncertainty if you're looking at, say, the, uh, the width of the, the likelihood profile to get your uncertainties. So this is a problem in that we, we have some intrinsic um, uh, uncertainty associated with the fact that we don't really know which of these, if any, are, are the right uh, choice for the background. So it's, it's a choice that we've introduced in the analysis and we have to somehow account for. So here I'll just list a few different uh, kind of solutions, which I think uh, were out there certainly before um, we, we introduced this paper and, and, and are probably st are still there now. Uh, is of course, the first one is you can just pick your favorite model and ignore the rest of them. And uh, you know, as, long, as long as no one disagrees with you, maybe that's, that's fine. Uh, the second idea might be that you, you could take something like the difference in the results that you get from these, these fits and then just quote that as an uncertainty on your 
on your fitted parameters. The problem with that is that, of course, if you're trying to uh, fit multiple parameters or you, know, you want to have a 2D likelihood, then it's very difficult to, to, to just take a difference and add it in, add it, uh, in quadrature as a systematic. Uh, you could also maybe try throwing toys uh, to assess the differences and, and add a systematic that way, but you have the same issues with number two. Uh, and then another method which was uh, quite popular uh, in the early days of the Higgs, at least, was to just um, try and use the largest, uh, uh, most free function that you can. So, so maybe you, you, you pick some function that has lots of parameters uh, and, and you try and somehow minimize any potential bias that might be introduced from this choice. So this was certainly what we did in the early days of the, of the, of the, the by photon analysis. Uh, but the, the, the issue there is that you end up with, with um, uh, non-optimal kind of um, uncertainties because you're, 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 you're arbitrarily increasing the, uh, the variance in order to cover any kind of systematic that you might introduce. So of course, what we want to know is how, how do we actually choose the right model to use? How do we quote the results? And how do we assign a systematic uncertainty from that choice that we've made? Uh, and so this this um, this talk is going to discuss a, a method which we which we developed um, around the time of the Higgs discovery, um, which is really a method for treating this model choice as if, as if it were a, a, a nuisance parameter in its own right. So in this in this sense, we we consider it like a discrete nuisance parameter. So this talk just um, summarizes the work uh, that was done by myself and um, uh, my colleagues at Imperial, uh, and it's it's it's. Uh, um, documented in this paper here you can find published in GINST uh, in case you want to take a look at this after. Um, I should say that this is not a silver bullet solution by any means. Um, it's certainly one method um, which we use in CMS quite a lot to address this problem. Um, and I'll, I'll, at the end I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through a few open issues as well about um, how, you know, how maybe there's, there's ways that this method can be improved. Okay, so, so to introduce this idea of a discrete nuisance parameter, I want to step back a little bit and, and try and uh, think about or show you how you can think about a nuisance parameter in a way maybe, maybe you haven't thought of before. So consider this simple um, situation where we have a parameter of interest. So maybe this is the mass of the, of the signal that we're trying to fit. Uh, let's just call it X. Uh, and say we have uh, uh, one nuisance parameter. So maybe it's the, maybe we fit an exponential and you just have the slope of the exponential as, as, the, uh, as the nuisance parameter. And all the other parameters are fixed, so we just imagine that we know everything else perfectly. And then you might um, uh, profile, uh, you might construct a likelihood and then profile over your, your theta parameter uh, um, as a function of your x parameter, and you end up with a profile likelihood curve like this. Um, and then you can say, well, what, what happens if I fix my nuisance parameter to the best fit value? So this is what you would get if you had the uh, theta at its best fit value would end up with this blue line. Uh, and you can say, what happens if I fix theta to some random value? So maybe I get this red dashed line here. Uh, and I try a few more different values for, for this nuisance parameter and I end up with all these different red lines. And eventually what I'm doing, as you can see, is by trying all these different values of the nuisance parameter, as you know, what I'm doing is just filling in this curve until I build up eventually something like uh, uh, this, this green curve, which is essentially the envelope or the, the minimum likelihood value at any point in X from all those different values of theta, right? So this, of course, is exactly what you know uh, we mean when we say profiling is that we profile by profiling over theta, we take at each value of X, the maximum likelihood estimate of theta um, as our value of theta. And so if I only did it for a few discrete points, of course, then I'd end up with this kind of funny looking green curve. But the more and more points I have, the smoother this green curves look until I eventually I basically fill up the full likelihood profile. Okay, so the, uh, the, the reason why I'm going through this kind of weird convoluted way of explaining what a nuisance parameter is, is because I can kind of think of a discrete uh, nuisance parameter as just being a particular choice of that value theta. Okay, and that's in the end what I'm going to call my choice of, of model. I'm going to treat it as though it was a discrete nuisance parameter. Okay, so um, looking at a more realistic example, so taking the data that I showed you before, uh, which is a sort of simple data set that's a, a diphoton, Higgs to diphoton like data set. Um, here, what I'm looking at as my parameter of interest is just the signal strength, so the amount of signal in that bump, uh, which I'm, which I'm going to label mu. And I can define a, a log likelihood ratio. So if I, if I uh, just look at this data as, as binned data, then I can define a binned log likelihood ratio just like this. 
Um, so this is just the standard form of a, of a log likelihood ratio. Uh, and then the um, uh, just to, to explain what each of these terms in, then the, the expectation, of course, in each bin um, mu uh, is just given by a particular background model uh, plus the signal strength time, times the, uh, the expected signal rate. So, for example, uh, typically in, 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 uh, in high energy physics, what we do is we say that when mu plus one, that is equal to some particular theory or some theoretical model, for example, the standard model. Um, so if the background parameters, um, which I'm labeling theta, are free parameters, um, then uh, typically what we, uh, what we do is we profile them so that uh, these expectation values uh, instead become dependent on the values theta. And then as a function of mu, we calculate the profile likelihood ratio to obtain a profile likelihood curve. Um, now, in, in this method, the idea is that we would, we would create a profile likelihood curve for each of the different background choices that we have. So here, I've just got four different uh, simple functions uh, um, that, I'm, that I'm filling to my uh, data and then building up the profile likelihood curve. Okay, so then the prescription following the same idea is what you would do with a, um, a continuous nuisance parameter is just take the minimum of all the curves as a function of, of the signal strength mu, and this is what we call the envelope. So the idea is that if more than one function contributes to that envelope, then the, the, the log likelihood curve gets wider, uh, which essentially is increasing uncertainty. So the plot here just shows you uh, what I would get for my um, profiled log likelihood if I just fixed the um, background choice to a particular function, so that's what the, the red dash line shows. And then instead, if I, if I look at all the different functions and take the minimum of the, uh, the log likelihood function at any particular point, I get the black line. Okay, so you can see that obviously um, this has widened the curve on one particular um, side. So in some sense, it's not that we're choosing a model. So we're not, we're not picking a model um, ahead of time to fit the data. We're essentially letting um, the data choose the model for us in this way. So each point in, in mu, the, the, the background model that best fits for that value of mu might actually change. It might be a different um, background model that is, is, is best fit into the data. So what you end up with is um, a profile likely, a log likelihood curve, which means of course you can have a, a maximum likelihood estimate for uh, the signal strength, uh, which is good. Um, and then you might be tempted to draw um, confidence intervals in the usual way, uh, you know, appealing to Wilkes theorem. So you, you take the value where um, the delta log likelihood uh, crosses one as your 68% uh, and so on. Um, we're going to look a little bit about what, um, why we do this and, and, and try to show um, empirically why, why this seems to work. Okay, so one thing you can look at is, is how often this, um, this procedure of, just, of, of um, letting the data choose the PDF um, actually works. So um, in each of these plots, what I've done is, I'm, uh, is I've, I've thrown data from a particular one of the, one of the background functions. So, so I, there were three functions that I was looking at. So there's an exponential function, a simple power law function, and then something um, uh, uh, the first term in the Lawrence series. And the idea is just to generate um, uh, pseudo data from each of these functions and then run this method of, of, of letting the data pick the best function and then see which function is, is picked out uh, most of the time. So you can see that in general, um, what happens is that when you have uh, when you have something like the exponential, uh, most of the time the, the best fit function that you get back is the exponential, but you also have contributions in some certain cases from the other the other functions as well. Where the, where the functions are very similar to one another, you, you, uh, you end up with more of a 50-50 split. So for example, with the power law here, um, there's a sort of 50-50 split between fitting the power law and the other, the other functions. So um, you could also ask how, how well does the method um, sort of behave in terms of, 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 of bias and, and coverage properties? And, um, and this also investigates this idea of just appealing to um, the usual Wilkes theorem of, of, uh, of finding the crossing at delta log likelihood um, less than one. Uh, and you can look at this again in, again in toys. So in each of these, these plots again, and what I'm doing is generating pseudo data from each of the different background functions. And then I'm rerunning my um, my method again, letting the data pick function uh, and, and uh, finding the envelope, and then and then finding the region at which um, 
uh, at, at which the delta log likelihood changes by one. And then I can calculate a pull for each of my toys and look at that distribution. So here on the, on the bottom left, if you, if you um, I take a look at this plot, this is just the distribution where I'm, I'm uh, uh, fitting with just the exponential um, when I'm generating with an extra exponential. So obviously in that, in that case, we expect the pull distribution to look uh, pretty reasonable, centered at zero with the width of one. Uh, but you can see if instead, if I, if I generate the toys with a, um, an exponential and I fit with the wrong function, so I fit only with a power law, I, I introduce a bias. So you can see that the pull distribution is shifted away from zero uh, and the width is also, um, uh, is also not one. So, so this would be uh, um, uh, you know, a demonstration that by fitting the wrong function, you, you can introduce this, this bias. However, if I fit back with the envelope, so here again, I'm generating with an exponential, but I'm, you know, I'm instead of just uh, um, choosing one of the functions, I let the data choose each time. You can see that now I brought this um, pull distribution back towards zero, so the mean is much closer to zero, uh, and everything is well behaved again. So this, the idea of this this method is really to try and let the data choose the right uh, the right function in each case. So we tested this um, uh, this idea on on uh, uh, a number of different um, assumptions for which function is is the real function. Uh, and also uh, for different values of the, of the signal strength. So what's the true value of the signal strength injected? Uh, again, running toys in each case, just to see how, the, um, uh, how this bias actually changes uh, as, you, as you change those parameters. So what you can see in each case, for example, if I, if I look at the top um, figure here, this is the case when I'm, I'm um, uh, uh, generating with the, um, uh, this is when I'm generating with the um, power law function, and then I'm fitting with with one of the different uh, different methodologies. So again, you can see that if you generate with the power law, but you fit you fit with an exponential, you can see quite a large bias in terms of the pull. So the the, the mean of the pull here is around uh, minus zero point four. But if instead you use the um, the envelope, which is this um, these uh, uh, black triangles, you get something which is closer to zero. So the envelope is able to reduce the bias. And, and what you what you notice is that in each of these cases the envelope is always the one um, you know overall which is which is generally giving you something closer to zero. Of course, if you knew exactly what the function was, you would fit with that function and end up with zero bias. But of course, that's exactly the case we're trying to deal with where we don't know what the function is. So we also um, looked at the coverage. So of course, we're we're using this um, procedure of, of just choosing the. Um, uh, the region for which delta log likelihood is less than one to give us a 68% um, interval. Uh, and of course, we can we can test that with toys as well. So in, in these plots, I'm, I'm showing exactly the same thing. Um, so that the, 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 the different panels represent the same thing as before. But this time, what I'm looking at is the ratio of the coverage that I calculate in the toys um, to the expected coverage for a 68.3% interval. So again, you can see that this, um, this envelope method, which are the black triangles, are, uh, are in, in all of these cases are landing pretty much on that line, that 68.3% line. So we also know that the coverage properties of the interval um, that we're extracting with this method are quite good and crucially independent of the real background function that we choose. So it doesn't matter which of these background functions we choose, we find that the coverage um, is always around 68.3%. You would notice that that's not true if we were to use the wrong function compared to the uh, the one which is generated again at the top here, if I generate with a power law, if it with an exponential, you end up under uh, under covering with with those inputs. I should say, sorry, this coverage is obviously in terms of the signal strength that I'm fitting, um, as is the bias, because that's the, at the end of the day the thing I'm interested in. Because that wasn't obvious. Okay, so probably you know you realize that um, there's uh, there's uh, an issue here, which is. Um, of course, what if you what if you have different um, functions with, with different numbers of, of degrees of freedom or different numbers of parameters, and you want to use those different functions uh, um, to compare to one another and, and include in this method? So um, we ask ourselves, how, how do we actually compare models with different numbers of parameters uh, in the first place? So um, the value that we get for our, our um, uh, delta log likelihood or, or lambda is, is sort of an indicator of um, relatively how well the data agrees with a particular point in the model space. You can kind of think about it like that. So it doesn't really account for um, the degrees of freedom used to make that agreement. So of course, 
if you uh, if you were to just use a function with more and more degrees of freedom, more and more parameters, what you would tend to see is that you just get better and better fits, and you would always end up choosing um, the most flexible model in any uh, out of any set of models. So there's not a natural mechanism just within Lambda itself for ignoring those higher uh, higher order functions when calculating this thing. So the idea is we wanted to come up with a way to correct um, the, um, the, the this value of Lambda that we use. Uh, in order to account for those different numbers of um, uh, of, of parameters, um, and it's not obvious; it wasn't immediately obvious to us how how we should uh, do this. So, of course, we tried a few different methods in, in the paper. So, the first um, the first thing we we sort of cooked up was to um, uh, something called, that we call the p-value correction. So, so for bins, likelihood fits. If you think about the high statistics limit, then this um, lambda. Is, is roughly going to be distributed as a chi-squared distribution with the number of degrees of freedom just equal to the number of bins um, in the data uh, minus the number of parameters that you're, you're fitted to. So um, appealing to this, we can convert the p-value um, into, uh, sorry, we can convert this, um, this chi-squared into a p-value just using the standard um, uh, CDF of a chi-squared. And, uh, uh, and then what we can do is we can find a new value of lambda, which would have given us the same p-value, um, but with the degrees of freedom uh, such that the number of parameters is zero. So the degree of freedom now is just exactly equal to the number of bins. So what we're, what we're saying is we want to find, we want to find this new value of, of, of lambda, lambda prime, which would give us exactly the same p-value that we had in our, in our real fit. Um, but assuming that there are no uh, uh, degrees of freedom. So once we've done that, we can just define the correction for this log, log likelihood is just the difference between those two values of lambda. So we can correct that value of lambda by just this difference. Now, um, if you think about the, the, the sort of the distribution of a chi-squared, especially as you as you get to larger and larger bins, um, the uh, uh, those distributions are going to have uh, you know, different different variances, and so actually the um, the correction that you end up with is uh, depends on the p-value that you had in the first place. So this plot here just shows you um, the change of chi-squared that you would that you would need in order to make this correction as a function of p-value. Uh, the plot on the right just shows the distribution of this change, uh, assuming a, pl a flat distribution of the p-value. So in, in in a sense, when you have um, more degrees of freedom, you actually have to you have a larger correction. Um, uh, to, to deal with on average, but also that correction changes more drastically as a function of p-value. What we did actually notice, though, um, it, probably it's obvious, but if you if you look at uh, sort of most of the range of this p-value, and certainly around 0 0.5, where you might have a, a reasonable quality fit, essentially the difference in terms of this chi-squared is just equal to the number of parameters, which is kind of what you expect. You expect that um, on average, your um, the, the the additional um, or the reduction in the chi squared, if you like, is just going to be equal to the number of additional parameters you have, or the additional number of degrees of freedom, um, really. So, so um, what we did actually in this uh, in this paper was we tried two different two different methods based on this. One in which we really apply this correction as a function of uh, the signal strength, um, looking at different values of, of the p value as a function of this, of this um, signal strength. And then one where we just assume this this approximate that for most of the time, since it, the difference is just the number of parameters, we're just going to add that as a correction. Okay, so we can go back to the um, to the example of data spectrum that we had, and now we so this is exactly the same data set, but now I'm I'm not just trying the four simple functions that I had originally, but I'm also trying um, functions within that those families of functions that have more parameters. So, so I've got polynomials, I've got exponentials, I've got power laws, and I've got Lorentz series. But here now I'm, I'm allowing for additional um, terms in those, in those functions. So instead of just having a single exponential, I might have a sum of two or three exponential terms. I might have a polynomial with higher, um, higher order um, coefficients, uh, and I might have sums of power laws. And again, <clears throat> you can see the problem is that all of these functions by I, okay, maybe, maybe not this, uh, this sort of straight line one, the blue one, all the other ones look fairly reasonable. They all look like good fits, but nevertheless, they all give you different, slightly different values of the fitted signal strength. And so, this again is a, is, is the issue with um, with uh, uh, you know, with this model selection. 
So here's, here's, here's what the um, different profile lighted um, curves look like for all those different functions when you don't apply any correction to the, to the delta log up So, so you just have this, um, this lam lambda um, uh, cap calculation. So on the right-hand side is what you would get if you took the minimum envelope of all those different um, curves. And of course, you might, as you might imagine, the one that you end up with is essentially exactly the same as this one, which is our polynomial with six parameters which in this setup is actually our most flexible function that we have. So as I, as I mentioned before, if you apply no correction at all, so you don't account for the fact that these all have different numbers of parameters, you just end up with the function that is the most flexible given the data. And of course, this is gonna give you the largest um, variance. However, if you, if, you, uh, if you correct all of these likelihood curves with this p-value correction that I, I, I mentioned, uh, you will, you'll end up with something different. So this is, this is what we get if you, um, if you correct uh, with, the, with this p-value correction, which, which, as I said, is approximately just like adding one to this um, lambda for every degree of freedom. So for every parameter, you just add one. And you can see that we've changed the relative heights of all of these um, log likelihood curves. And now when you look at the lambda um, correction, it's no longer the case that a single function is only contributing to the curve, but you have different contributions from different functions. And again, if you just take a look at the, um, the plot on the right, the red curve just gives you the, um, the profile likelihood curve that you would get if you just um, looked at the best fitting function, um, whereas the, the black one is, is taking into account the contributions from all those other functions. So, so this is certainly much more, uh, you know, if, if I go back to my, my simple case where I just had four functions, you can see that um, you really just have a sort of you know, two, two or three of the functions um, contributing anyway. But as you start to throw in more functions into this uh, into this procedure, you start to fill out um, a sort of smoother looking, looking like you okay. okay, so we can also then go back and check the bias and the coverage properties now um, using this, this correction and, and now including more functions where we have additional um, numbers of parameters or different numbers of parameters. And, um, uh, and see see what this gives us. So so we actually tried um, in this paper we tried three different um, three different versions of this correction. So uh, the 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 one which I described uh, as the p-value correction is this um, these blue squares, uh, and then the approx p-value is where we just ignore the fact that um, the correction depends on the p-value and we just we approximate it with one per parameter. And then we also um, since we were looking at, you know, through the literature for uh, for different um, model selection type uh, uh, um, uh, procedures, we also came across this Akaiki information criterion, which which we also tried um, to include as well. So the plots here show um, on the left hand side what the bias looks like as a function of um, the signal strength, the, the the assumed signal strength mu. So this is the true value of the signal strength we're trying to trying to estimate. Um, for the different um, uh, for different functions uh, that we generate from. So here we're just picking um, different functions within that whole set of functions, generating toys and again calculating the bias. Uh, in in, so the bias here is calculated in terms of the expected value of, of this pull quantity as a function of mu. And you can see that um, again, if you just look at the the, the blue squares. Um, the bias is relatively uh, relatively small in all of these different cases. No matter what the filling function is, you end up with a relatively small bias. What we did notice with the Akaiki um, uh, type correction is that you you end up with a slightly larger bias because the correction is actually um, slightly more uh, more penalizing than our p-value correction. If you look at the coverage, however, you see that the, the all the three different methods actually give you rather good coverage um, for the different uh, different assumed um, functions. So again. The idea is that the it doesn't matter which is the true underlying distribution. This method um, will give you something which has a, a low bias and also a pretty reasonable um, coverage, uh, at least in the in the sort of scenarios that we uh, we investigate this here. So here's here I'm just listing the the other forms of correction that we um, that we were we were looking at as well. Uh, so we, so we, uh, like I said, we we um, we had this approximate p-value uh, correction where we simply in, increase the likelihood, um, the log likelihood ratio by the number of parameters that are, are in the fit. Uh, then there's also this um, AIC, so the Akaiki information criterion, which essentially boils down to adding two um, to the um, log likelihood ratio for each parameter. Uh, 
Uh, then there's also the, um, the, the uh, in the literature, there's a Bayesian information criteria, which is essentially like adding um, a, a factor log n times the number of parameters instead. And in general, what, what, we, what we notice is they, they, they essentially all seem to take the form um, of, of, of correcting the, the log likelihood ratio by a constant times the number of parameters. So this correction is always something like this. So I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So we also looked at what happens to the um, to the interval that we extract in over a series of pseudo experiments, or, or the error, if you like, that you extract when using this um, this envelope uh, method um, to sort of quantify or get a handle on, on on how much of a systematic we're actually introducing by 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 including this method. So here. Um, I'm just showing the distribution of the 68% um, the intervals or the size of those intervals uh, in pseudo experiments um, when we're um, uh, generating with, uh, I think this is generating with a power law, but then fitting with different, uh, different um, assumptions. So the green is what you would get if you were fitting with the power law alone. So you could think of this as just the statistical uncertainty. This is the case where I've really got the same model as the, as the truth model. And then um, the three different colored points are what you get for the distribution of the, um, the interval when you include um, the other functions in the envelope and, and, and use that. So you can see in general, you're, you're increasing the, um, the uncertainty or incre increasing those intervals. Uh, and in particular, the, the, you increase them more using the, uh, the approx and the exact p-value and, and slightly less using the FAQ. But in general, the idea is that the difference between um, this distribution and these distributions is effectively the systematic uncertainty. That's what we're including as an additional uncertainty, uh, if you like, from running this method. Um, so we also studied what happens to the um, to the to the fitted value or the or the average bias and the um, and the intervals as you change this correction. So as I said, all all of these corrections seem to be of the form just adding constant times the uh, the number of parameters in the fit. And so we wanted to just try different values for that, that parameter C. So here, uh, the plot on the right just shows you, again, assuming different um, functions of the true functions, um, what that, um, uh, in this case, I think it's the bias, what that bias looks like uh, in, for, for these points um, as a function of that correction. So the, the, the points themselves show you what the, what the bias is, and then the blue shaded bands show you the, 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 the size of the interval. And you can see actually there's not a huge dependence. Um, it's not really a massive dependence, at least between going from uh, close to zero up to three for this value of C. Um, but there is a trade-off. There is a small trade-off. As you increase the correction, um, in some cases you end up with, with increasing the bias. Um, but of course, at the same time, increasing the correction reduces the, um, the uncertainty band. Um, that you would extract. And of course that makes sense, right? Because the, the, the larger this value of C, the more you're penalizing functions that are larger numbers of parameters, um, which means you're, you're, not, you're less likely to include them in your interval. Uh, uh, and so you're reducing the systematic due to them, but at the same time, you're, you're, um, you're trading that off with, with introducing a potential bias from, from not using those functions. So I think what this sort of told us is that, that this is actually a, a trade-off which can be tuned for a particular analysis um, and something which is which, which um, you know depending on exactly the setup you're using, this C parameter can be tuned, and one would naturally run these kind of studies to see where is the where is the sweet spot for um, for actually um, you know, deciding what that value of C is. Okay, so finally here I think uh, this is just to show as a function of the um, the C value what we got for the central value and the um, the uncertainty uh, or the or the intervals from from our actual our toy data set that we had. So again, at large values of C, where we with the potential have bias, you can see that the, the uncertainty band is shrinking. Uh, so again, this is just the trade-off that one has to do, uh, one has to study uh, when, when using this method. Okay, so we also um, wanted to sort of get a handle on, on why, why this seems to, to, to work. So it, it seemed kind of arbitrary that we should um, Use the same um, rule as, as we normally do, i.e., Wilkes theorem that we that we look for a crossing of um, delta log likelihood less than one. Sorry, two times delta log likelihood less than one uh, in our parameter of interest in order to extract the sixty eight point three percent interval. Um, and so, we what we wanted to look at was the distribution of our test statistic um, 
for the different uh, different correction values uh, and see if it sort of holds up. So of course, if, if, if Wilkes theorem is true, then we expect this distribution of this test statistic to look like a, a chi squared with a number of degrees of freedom equal to the number of parameters. In our case, this is we just have a single parameter mu, so it should be a chi squared with one degree of freedom. Um, and you can see in each of these cases, uh, yeah, so there's a no correction, uh, correction of one and correction of two. Of course, no correction is exactly the um, uh, the case that we you know, we wouldn't use because that would be a, uh, you know always using just the most flexible function. But if you look at c equals one and c equals two, the, the chi squared, the, the distribution of this test statistic indeed does follow a chi squared rather well. And you can see it's actually independent on whether the function that you end up fitting is the correct function. So you end up fitting back the, the same background function as you generate with, or if it's a different function, you also have a chi-square distribution. And so naturally, when you sum the two, you end up with a chi-square distribution. So at least empirically, it does seem that this test statistic, including the correction, um, is distributed as a, as a chi-square. We want to go with you. Okay, so, so that was that was the method I, I said at the beginning that I would want to um, sort of go through a few open questions or uh, points that we've we sort of thought at, uh, thought about since we put out the paper um, where we where we think maybe there could be improvements made and, and maybe to maybe some of the audience can, can use this to to ask questions and things. Uh, so the first one is: Is there really an analytic proof or, or, or a better motivation for the correction that we use for lambda? So as I said, we have this sort of empirical evidence that the the, the, the bias and the coverage seem to behave well. The distribution of the test statistic um, looks like one would expect for an asymptotic um, uh, form. So it looks like a, a chi-square distribution, but we don't really have a good um, understanding of why that should be. Um, and also here, here, I've, um, here, here I've, I've refocused on a frequentist approach. So I'm, I'm only looking at uh, um, uh, frequentist uh, um, confidence intervals. Whereas if, uh, in principle, one could imagine putting this in a Bayesian setting and then deriving Bayesian credible intervals. And I've got a slide on that um, in a minute. Um, then there's sort of more practical um, things to think about with this method. So of course you have to decide ahead of time how many models you want to include in your in your family of functions in your envelope. And um, of course, if if you have infinitely many different functions, how do you actually um, sort of par those down so that you end up with a reasonable set that you can practically run over and, and, and calculate in a fit? So what we tend to do is is, is throw things like Fisher tests and goodness of fit tests to, to sort of find a reasonable range of of functions. Such that uh, you know we're not having to deal with with functions that won't anyway contribute to the right here. Um, then of course you can ask the question of how one might assess how many model choices is appropriate. So is is there a better way of sampling the model face space? Um, so here the functions that we chose are particularly motivated by the kinds of functions that we expect to see for the diphoton um, background. But of course. Uh, you know, one, one could think of, of better ways to um, systematically sample the uh, the potential space of smoothly falling background um, functions. Uh, and, and, and in principle, if one can find a way to get a complete set, then that would that would um, you know that would hopefully motivate uh, um, particular choices of corrections and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, one one has to worry about uh, which restrictions should be placed on the set of functions. Of course, we 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 don't want to choose any function. Because in principle, um, picking any function would mean that we would completely remove the signal uh, and never be able to measure anything. So we may have to think about things like uh, restricting higher derivatives or inflections in, in the function. Uh, and of course, there's a huge literature about uh, about that kind of thing. So just to quickly on on just to maybe give people a, uh, something to think about is 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 um, we did start to look at a, a Bayesian formalism for this. So if you if you try and think about this in terms of a Bayesian context. Um, you can kind of think about um, each of these discrete profiles, uh, or the equivalent in a Bayesian context is, is that you would end up with posterior distributions for each of the individual functions that you would then add up weighted according to um, the, the exponent of this correction. So in, in, where, where in our log likelihood ratio, this, um, this term is just, um, uh, is just added to the log likelihood. Instead, you would multiply effectively by a prior, um, uh, which is given by just the exponent of that correction, and then so effectively you're just summing summing up these posteriors in, in um, uh, weighted according to these priors. So, so this is about as far as we got with this idea, and I think it would might maybe make a nice uh, project for uh, for a PhD student or, or a master student to try and figure out whether or not um, 
um, this works. Uh, but I do think there may be some value in, in trying to put this in a, in a Bayesian context, at least to better motivate where, where this correction comes from. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize here. So, so I, I, I hopefully showed you uh, this, uh, well, I say a new method, it, the method is relatively old by now, uh, for treating this model choice problem that we have quite often in, in high energy physics, um, such as, as, as discrete nuisance parameters. Uh, with the idea being that we try and appeal to the usual uh, way we deal with nuisance parameters in, in that we somehow profile this choice uh, by taking the envelope of, of, of the log likelihood curves. Um, the, uh, the, the, the issue of the choice of the correction is, is something which I think is open to, to the end user and I think is something that's um, worth studying in each use case of what exactly that correction should be. And again, this is a trade-off between, between minimizing um, the bias and, and the variance. Uh, and of course, which choice of, of models is something which is a relatively open question. And again, that requires some expertise input as to, as to a reasonable set of functions that uh, describe the data well. So at least in, in the toy example that we um, showed here, but also um, in practice uh, for, the, for the analyses that we actually apply this to at CMS, what we always find is that this method has pretty um, uh, good properties in terms of always yielding a relatively small bias and a rather good coverage. And crucially, the coverage is independent of the assumptions that are, that are, that are, that are underlying. So regardless of which functions we end up throwing from, the coverage uh, remains good. Uh, and as I said, this method has been used actually in, in a number of real data analyses at CMS in a number of publications now. And, and again, those, those, those properties hold. Um, finally, there are several sort of extensions which, uh, which I think are worth thinking about and open questions for this method. And, and I'd certainly love to have your feedback if, uh, if you have any on or any thoughts on those kind of things. Uh, so that's it, Valinda. Cool, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk.